As much as it may seem like it is, this video's title is not clickbait. The button puzzle in Trover Saves the Universe is actually impossible. And in this video, I'm going to show you how we know that. The button puzzle shows up when you first encounter this locked gate with three locks to it. The first one is really easy. You just go over, hit the button. That works. You move on to the second one. The second one's really easy as well. Most people should be able to get through it just by blind guessing. Or you can just use the inversion and then second inversion. Super easy, right? And then you come to the third one. This one is absolute madness. Each button that you press changes what seems like almost a random different series of buttons all over the control pad. And if you keep pressing at it and pressing at it, after you press 50 times you actually get an achievement saying you're almost there, but you're not almost there. This puzzle is actually impossible. So how do we analyze this problem and find out whether a solution is even possible? Let's start with the buttons. We know that they can only either be red or green, and I'm going to assign those a values of 0 for red and 1 for green. Super simple. Next we have 9 buttons here. We need some consistent way to keep track of their values, so I'm going to call these x0 all the way through x8 from the top left to the bottom right, and that'll let us keep track of the values over time. Finally, we need some way to discuss what each button does when you press it. Pressing a button takes the buttons around it and the button itself and inverts their values. That is, if they're green, it turns them to red. If they're red, it turns it to green. We'll call each of these functions f0 through f8. An inversion is just the same as binary inversion. It converts a 1 to a 0 or a 0 to a 1. So, now that we have everything labeled, Let's take a look at an example of how we can write out one of the functions by looking at what the button does. Okay, let's start with button zero. We go up, press it, and watch what changes. There, did you catch that? In this case, pressing button zero changed the values of zero, one, three, four, and seven. So we'll write that like this. Okay, now let's do the same thing for all the rest of the buttons on the keypad and write down their functions as we go along. All right, list is done. So now that we have all these functions, we need to put them in some form that we can actually solve things using them. To do that, I first need to introduce the concept of exclusive or. Exclusive or, better known as XOR, is an operation that many of you are familiar with without even knowing it. When we say OR in English, what we really mean is exclusive OR. For example, let's say I ask you, would you like some cake or some pie? What I really mean is, you can have cake or you can have pie, but you can't have them both. That's what's known as an exclusive OR. This or that, but not both of them. Now you may say, I want both. Now that would just be a normal OR. You want A or B, or both of them. That's allowed too. In binary form, we would write it in a truth table like this. How do we read this truth table? Well, if A is zero and B is zero, then the output is zero. If either A or B is zero, but the other one is a one, then the output is a one. And if A and B are both ones, then the output is a zero. That's the exclusive part of exclusive or. So how does this help us with our functions? Well, exclusive or has a really neat property that whenever you XOR something with a zero, it leaves that value alone. And when you XOR something with a one, it inverts that value. So we can now write out all of our button states as a string of binary numbers, say this one right here. That represents the binary sequence here. Each location we want it to invert the value, we put a one there. In each location we want it to stay the same, we put a zero there. Now, using this technique, we can go back to all of our functions and write them as binary values that we can XOR with some set of button states to see what they would do to the buttons. Let's try it with function zero. Now, let's say our buttons look like this. We can write that as a binary string as shown here, 
then XOR it with the function to simulate pressing button 1. And what do we get? The binary string here. What did we get when we actually pressed the button? We get this, which exactly matches the binary string. So now, we know we can take any starting positions for the buttons, apply as many other button presses as we want to it just by applying the functions via XOR, and see what it would look like after the fact. Now the question is, can we compute the inverse? That is, can we find some series of button presses that will get us back to all ones? Before we do that, there are a few important properties of XOR that we need to cover first. The first one is that XOR is commutative. That is, AXORB is the same as BXORA. And that's pretty easy to tell because the variable order does not matter when you're taking the XOR. The second important property is that it's associative. You can do the XORs in any order that you want, and you'll still get the same result, no matter what. What this means for our purposes is that the buttons can be pressed in any order, and as long as you press the right buttons, you will eventually solve the puzzle, provided that a solution exists. The third important property is that XOR is its own self-inverse. What that means for us with the buttons is that if you press a button, and then you press that button again, you end up right back where you started. So, what this means is we can start with the solved state, which is all ones, and then try to find some combination of button presses that gets to our current state. Once we have that, those same button presses will be the inverse to go from our current state back to the solved state. The question then is, can we get to our current state from a solved state using button presses? So to figure this out, it's time to get some computer help. I've written a script here that will allow us to map out all of the possible states given a starting state and then the given functions. So as we can see right here, I have an apply function thing that takes an index, which would be that button index, and each of these are those values that we can XOR to apply the function to some given state. So this just takes in a state and a function and then applies that function to the state and returns it. So how are we going to walk through and find all possible solutions? Well, there's nine digits, so we know that at most there can be two to the ninth power possible states in the system. So we start off with 512, which is two to the ninth, all set to false. And then we're going to do a recursion thing where we go through each function and try out all possible combinations. In this recursive function, we start at, say, function zero. We say we can get to where our current state is, obviously. We then apply the function and say that where we got to after applying the function we were able to get to. And then we continue on to the next function, either trying it with this applied or with this not applied. So what happens is we end up, for each function, trying applying it or not applying it and all possible combinations thereof. Note that there's no point in applying the function more than once, because if you apply it second time, it just undoes the first time, and that's the same as doing it zero times, and so on. I also have another thing in here that we can use to actually print out the solution, and it's nearly identical to the previous one. So how do we actually apply this? Let's say we start off with this initial state here. The buttons going down from the top to the bottom would be green, green, red in the first row. Middle row would be green, red, green and the last row would be green, red, green. We're trying to get to a solve state where it's all greens or all ones. So we create a solver, we tell it to find all possible states, and then if it finds a solution, we'll say yes, it worked, and then it'll actually print out the solution here. So let's run that. And there it is, yay, it worked. To solve it, press these buttons, seven, five, four, two, one. And that'll work if you press those in any order to get you from this state to the solve state of 11111. But that's not where we end up with when we load up the game. Let's take a look at this screenshot again. From this screenshot, we actually get a different initial state. We get the initial state of red, green, green, red, green, red, 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 green, as shown here. And what happens when we run this? It says this value does not exist in the solution space. The question then comes up, how big is the solution space? Of all possible binary strings of nine digits long, how many of them can actually be reached just using the functions that we are given? If we plot this out, we can go 
count all of the true options in the solutions array. And there we go, 256. So only half of the possible nine digit binary strings can actually be solved in the game. And I've reloaded it many, 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 many times. You always start off with this initial state here, which is not in the solution space. Therefore, this puzzle actually has no solution. Not only does it have no solution, but they intentionally picked an initial starting state so that there would be no solution. If they picked it at random, you'd still have about a half chance of actually getting a solution that would work. But because they intentionally picked something outside of the solution space, you will not be able to solve this puzzle no matter how hard you try. Another way to visualize this is to actually plot the solution space as an image. This is what that looks like. The red squares are all of the squares that have possible solutions. And any guesses where we end up? That's right, we end up right here on this blue square. So, in conclusion, there it is. A proof by exhaustion of why the button puzzle in Trover Saves the Universe is actually impossible. Well, that's it for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed and I hope you learned something today. I'm enjoying making some more educational content on this channel, and I hope you guys enjoy watching it as well. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.